Now, NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting. Whether you're listening on TalkZone, by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. Our guest today, Jennifer Dean, experienced a childhood NDE when she developed a deadly form of leukemia and then a brain injury from her chemotherapy. At age 13, Jennifer went from a happy upbringing with her Irish Catholic family in New Jersey to these life-threatening circumstances with no hope from her doctors. She had a severe adverse reaction to her treatments, which threw her into a vegetative state. Aware but locked into her body, Jennifer was in and out of consciousness. Upon drifting into a coma, she was taken to a loving, peaceful void. Shortly after, she miraculously awoke from this state and made a full recovery, not only from her vegetative state, but from cancer as well. Needless to say, her doctors were stunned. Afterwards, her life was filled with many spiritual experiences. In her 20s, she was guided to work as an autopsy assistant with the county medical examiner, handling the organs and stitching up bodies. She had not quite understood the magnitude of her gifts at this time, but she was guided to hold a sacred space for the souls that were in the process of crossing over to the other side. She learned many valuable lessons from these souls and honors those lessons. As the years went on, she grew spiritually and began to understand what she had been through as a child. Her growing intuition revealed some future events as well as past lives. She believes even in past lives, she hadn't had children. Imagine her surprise then when shortly after grasping what her NDE had gifted, Jennifer conceived a child even though she had been told the chemo had probably made her infertile. There was no medical intervention to help her conceive, just simple divine timing and the profound hug from an angel. Jennifer has slowly integrated her NDE and other spiritual experiences over many years, with after-effects including out-of-body experiences, increased intuition, and mediumship abilities. She is now a pediatric Reiki nurse, has been initiated as a Magdalene Rose priestess, and describes herself as a mystic. Jennifer uses her gifts to help comfort her patients in their time of need. Her future goals are to help the Western medical community embrace spirituality so that we can finally treat the entire being to promote health, wellness, and happiness. Jennifer Dean, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you for having me. The whole story was written by you, so that's where the importance lies. Jennifer, let's begin with that time in 1995 when your life completely changed. They were treating your leukemia, and you could have wound up in a permanently vegetative state. So tell us about that. I was getting intrafecal chemotherapy, which is chemotherapy treatments in my spinal fluid. And they do this because leukemia is cancer of the blood, and there's like the blood brain barrier. So it can get through. If there's cancer cells that can get into the spinal fluid, it will attack the brain, and then you're talking brain cancer on top of it. So they do this to prevent that. But the reaction I had is an act like, Now it's more well-known, not well-known. It's still a very rare reaction, but it still happens. But when it happened to me, doctors had never seen it before. And I mean, I was sitting there, uh, like I can remember like it was yesterday. um, They had wheeled me. I had been outside in like a couple months because the, with my treatments and stuff, I had to stay inside. I had low counts, meaning I couldn't go around a lot of people. Um, because if I got sick, it could kill me. I didn't have an immune system. So they're about to start my um, radiation to my brain uh, because that's also part of the protocol for leukemia. In children, I'm pretty sure adults too, but I was a child and it was intense treatments. Um, so you'd get bone marrows, you get a spinal tap, you get the spinal injection of the chemotherapy. And then you go and get radiation to your brain on top of it. I have tattoos on my face where they they poke you a pen and put black ink because they got to line the sites up like the same way every time because whatever it touches, it's killing. And we're talking brain cells. So, you know, 
So I'm sitting there in the waiting room of, or they wheeled me over once they ended up wheeling me over from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to um, next door to the radiology center. Um, of It was the hospital in town. So it was just right next door. And I remember when he wheeled me out, it was just he feeling everything. It felt weird, almost like this is like my last moments in this life. I mean, when I look back at it, I'm like, yeah, because I that sun hit my face for the first time in months. The sound, the smells, like I was so detached. I was stuck in a room, you know. Um, and this was before we had cell phones. You know, so <laughs> it was basically movies and video games, maybe. Um, but yeah, so I'm sitting there and I'm waiting with my mom and all of a sudden, uh, my head, I started to feel like I couldn't hold my head on. And then my left arm went limp and then my left leg, I could pick it up. And I was like, I looked at my mom and I was like, something's wrong. And she was a home health aide for years. So she saw my mouth drooping and ran to get the nurse. She said, you know, my daughter's having a seizure or my daughter's having a, a stroke. And um, that's what they thought. They thought it was, that it was a stroke at first because it, it mimicked a stroke. Yes. And actually with this type of reaction, it does mimic a stroke. So they rushed me up to my, my hospital room and I'm just sitting there. I was still able i still used to my right side and i was slurry speech but it wasn't all gone yet um and my doctor came in because they called him and he came in he looked scared and like this i'm a nurse there are certain instances we are scared we don't know you can you you know he did say when i said he looked so scared so to me i'm like oh my goodness i was like am i gonna die and he's like i don't know and then actually I just looked off in the space and I was like, this is it. I was like, this is it. But you know what? I was like, I made peace with that. I was okay with that. Um, I mean, going through the treatments was hell. And I had almost died, like, in the very beginning because of being septic, you know? So I actually gave my parents a pin and everything. I felt this coming from a mile away. Um, and... So the weird part was the doctor came and then all of a sudden I was able to like use my left side again. It was so weird. They didn't know what was happening, but it was coming back. So they were like, okay, you know, and they did like the swallow test to make sure that I could swallow because they were going to give me lunch by mouth. So when they did the swallow test, I was fine. So I got my tray and I was eating and I was watching Stan like me with my dad and I went to swallow a piece of a carrot and I almost choked and I coughed it up. But my dad like looked at me quick because this is like, wait a minute, what's happening now? Um, and I, I felt it coming. I felt that I was about to drop. And I said to my dad, it's happening again. But he said he couldn't understand what I'm saying. It was just mumbled, but my eyes were tear filled. So, and then I was out, I was out and Every time I went out, I just remembered darkness and then I would come back and I think I was fighting to come back, you know, so I would come back, but every time I'd come back, I'd be a little bit less aware of my body in the situation because I remember coming back to my body a second time and waking up and being terrified because I was stuck in my body and I couldn't like communicate. And it was just this scary, that's probably one of the, I mean, the doctors didn't even beat her on the bush. They were like, listen, like, she'd be better off dead than in this position. And this, they, like, if they weren't, they weren't too, they, that was the 90s. I don't think they'd say that now. But um, it, I ended up in the darkness. I came back, I remember the one time I was terrified. And then this is when they had to do a spinal tap on me. Um. I was awake for this because my dad says he remembers just look, I was just looking at him crying and crying and crying and look, they did, it was like heartbreaking. Um, so when he was doing the spinal tap, I he couldn't give me any kind of anesthetic because they weren't giving me anything, no pain meds, nothing because they wanted me to wake up, not go to sleep. So he had to do without 
the pain meds they usually give me to knock me out. And, you know, I felt it all. I remember feeling him do it. And um, then they did, I remember being in the MRI and they put the headphones on me, which was sold with static, but they didn't have the radio station tuned enough. Like it was a very simple request I had, but I couldn't speak. So I'm laying here listening to static in the MRI, which is probably worse than legend listening to the banging of the MRI. So my dad was in the room and I remember I was kept telling my body, like, move your foot, move your foot. And I did, I wiggled my foot and my dad looked because he saw it and he saw like tears streaming down my face and he jumped up and actually started to pull the machine to get me out of it. And they came in and brought me out and they sat me up and they tried to give me a dry, dry erase board and a marker, but it was such a severe brain injury. My hands were like this. So I couldn't hold anything and I dropped it and I started crying. And I was like, this is going to be my life long. So, um, after that, I fully went out because that's when I fully went into the void. I think because I just let go. Mm-hmm. I was like, I just, I don't want to live like like this, you know? Um, especially because I, I wasn't born that way. It's so different. I feel like if there's somebody who was born like that and is used to that, but if you have the ability to talk, walk, communicate, do all these things, and then it's taken away, it's so... For a kid, it was terrifying, really. Sure. But then it... So. Go ahead and des- describe the void that you went into and what you remember of that. So what I remember is after that, like, terrifying event, and I was just, I would just cry and cry. I slipped fully out at this point, and I ended up in pitch darkness. Um, I, I did not see anything, but I felt... Like I was being swaddled by God, um, just very loved, um, no pain, which was a big thing because I was in a lot of pain with the treatment. So, um, don't no, you do come back to a body that's still in pain. It, that was confusing. As a child, I, I felt like, what did I do wrong? You know? But as I got older, I realized the pain is there for me to heal and help others heal theirs, you know, or to find a way to work with the pain. Um, but yeah, so I, I slipped into the void and I just remember feeling like, I can't explain it. And <laughs> it's just profound peace with no pain that no baby it is. Uh-oh. I don't usually cry either. There's shit. That's okay. <laughs> I think it's just the world. You know, you missed it. And this is normal. Like, this is the side that people don't see. It's, you miss the feeling. And like, you have to stick it out to get back there. So, I understand I'm on a mission now. But uh, when I went to that void and I felt that... And then I came back to my body and I woke up and my entire family was around my bed saying goodbye to me. I had a talk to like dance uncles, cousins, everybody. We had a big Irish And they were, I just, they looked so scared. And I was, I was like, I'm going to be okay, guys. Like in my head, obviously, I didn't know how I looked. If I knew how I looked, I'd be like, oh, that's why you're scared. But I felt fine. Like, I was like, no, I'm going to be fine. I don't know why they look scared. Why are you staring at me? Like, and then I looked up at the pole and I was like, what are they giving me? Because, like, I I was in the hospital before they, um, I had this ND for months. So I guess that's why I knew I was in the hospital because I'm, I was there for months anyway. It wasn't like I was at home and had been here at Dudley's parents and ended up in the hospital. Because I was like, very aware, just like, what are they giving me? And like, they weren't giving me anything. Um, the priest had already come in and gave me my last right. Um, so after that, I, I started to really like actually wake up and I was able to like use my body again, but I couldn't talk right away. So my aunt and cousins came up with like the index cars, they put words on, like, you know, um, 
if somebody like has a stroke, aphasia, and they can't speak. So, um, you know, I eventually walked right out of that hospital, perfectly fine. Um, I even remember, um, when I, to try and learn to speak again, intuitively, I was, um, I was told to like listen to music and try and keep up. And so I would always do that. Like, and my father said after that, when I came back, I still had a good year and a half of treatments to go through. And that's where a lot of more damage came to my body. Like I will, I was, it was probably within the first seven months of treatment of like an 18 month protocol or 24 month protocol. So it was just the very beginning in your difference. And I had a whole regimen of cancer treatments to go through. Um, and I did. And I did I don't think I had any more experiences during that time, but that was the biggie. And I mean, I had doctors just flowing in my room. My dad will say to this day, oh, they were just coming in like in hordes because it was I just woke up. They're like, we don't know how you woke up. Like, you, we didn't do anything. So it was like, all right, well, this is the power to give a body. <laughs> and you know what? When I sat there at 14 years old, all these white coats, all these doctors said it was a teaching hospital, which is fine. I'm a nurse. I, you know, I appreciate the patients that are willing to, you know, work with the students because that's how we learn, you know? But I just remember them all coming in and looking at me and I was like, I must, uh, because after I survived that, and he's always, why did I survive that? Like, it was a, such a huge thing. Why did I survive that? And it was always like, I was coming up with reasons why. And that made me think, well, maybe I survived that to help doctors keep their minds open. So like now I'm a Reiki nurse and I'm trying to... Okay. Did the word miracle ever come to uh, a yeah. doctor's Yeah, oh, life? yeah, yeah, doc my doctor said that's a miracle. She woke up, she yeah. my, my dad will tell you. Yeah, because I blocked a lot of it out for a very long time. I know, the, you, you didn't remember this until later on, did you? Yeah, it took uh, probably until 2015 to where I started even, like, looking. I somehow was done, and this is after the spiritual experience. Well, let's take you to your amazing job as an assistant to doing autopsies. <laughs> this was oh, when you, yes. this was this your first job right out of school? No, actually this job, you don't need to go to school for. It's actually on the job. Well, now you may need to go to school for, but this was like 20 years ago. So the rules were much more flexible. So I didn't go to school, but I was trained on the job, basically like, with an autopsy assistant or a deaner, which that is the sign that I knew I was right where I was meant to be because I was Jen Dean, the deaner. So it was like perfect. By the way, I looked it up. A deaner, D-I-E-N-E-R, is an autopsy tech. The word comes from yeah. a German Leichendiener or corpse servant. Yeah. Corpse servant. That's quite a term, isn't it? Wow. Well, so that's why I'm like sometimes just working with the dead they kind of it sticks with you kind of like feel like i'm always, yeah. i look like i'm always in mourning and like everybody laughs because but i'm the such a light filled person but i like wearing a lot of black there was one pathologist who said a good deaner is worth his or her weight in gold yeah there's they definitely held out but yeah in my early 20s i was guided to that job i remember i started to work at the hospital the local hospital and um I actually worked there in in-house patient transport. And when I got that job, part of the job in being in-house patient transport is bringing the bodies down to the ward. And the manager was asking me, he's like, are you going to have a problem with that? And I was like, no, I don't know how to follow with that. And he's like, well, there's a job that you can do. If it posts up there, it's in histology. You know, go and if you want, if you would actually like to do that, I'm like, oh, I'll do it. And like maybe a year later, it popped up and I got it. Mm. Did you cut the bodies open or did you, I know you dealt with the organs and then you had to sew the body back together after the work was done? Yeah. The deaner is usually the one that actually does the cutting 
it depends actually really on the pathologist or the medical examiner. Mm-hmm. But the ones I work with, they had the deer do all that and they just took the organs to gross. They did what they had to do and they went. Like that's all they're there for. Or tell the sheriff, you know, take a picture here or fingerprints. So it's weird when you look back because I didn't remember I almost died like that. I didn't remember where I went. So to have ran the job like face to face with death because I was absolutely not afraid of death. I knew these souls were in a better place and this is their vessel. Mm-hmm. Um, I realized they may be attached to their vessel still because they're not fully like understanding that they are gone. So I never was afraid of anything except for once I was sawn up a body and the power went out. And let me, it took me one big, huge hop to get from that door. <laughs> and I was, like, <laughs> I was like, I've seen too many scary movies. Okay, it's going to be okay. I was like, I am not getting stuck down here with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us how you dealt with those souls that were in shock and still hanging around. Well, basically, they just hold a loving space where they can just kind of process the magnitude of what happened. Usually, it's a traumatic death. So these are homicide, suicide, car accidents, unattended death. And sometimes the soul doesn't even realize what happened yet because we get the cases within like 24 hours of death. So that soul is still kind of in transition. So it's interesting, Ro, because then in my nursing career, I worked with hospice cases. And it was very much the same where that patient or that soul was in transition from her body, like, and you could see it happening. So with this, it's just they're detached from the vessel, and I could feel them there, and I was just always, like, go to the light. Even if I think back now to certain cases, I tell, I will try to speak to the soul because time doesn't matter. So if I could go back to that space right now with what I know now and tell that soul to go to the light and don't be afraid. So I do that often where I, I will, um, if I think back and I was like that, maybe I shouldn't, because I'll do a lot of like, maybe I shouldn't have said this. It's like very human, but it's like you just the presence and let the soul just transition in their own time because all souls do. So I just basically, it was just me and the body most of the time. And, it, you know, there was probably maybe 45 minutes and a full autopsy from, like, I get everything out and set up, then we do the autopsy, and then I have to clean up, which just entails, yes, putting the organs back in the body, sewing the body up, and getting ready for the funeral home to come pick it up. And, you know, there's a lot of, of even that work is, you know, you got to be careful with the cutting so that the body is presentable. You know, it's a very just sacred job. You work with the dead like that, it's a very sacred job. But, you know, you had to be a certain amount detached from those type of cases. There was one soul, I guess a man who had lung cancer. Yeah. That attached himself to you. Tell us about that. I was still new, and I was all gowned up, ready to go, and the body was on the table, sheriffs were on this side, the doctors waiting for the organs on this side, just, you know, patiently waiting. And as they're telling the case, talking about it, he ended his life because he was at the end of his life anyway, and he was in too much pain, and he couldn't take it anymore. And even the way he did it in a bathroom, so nobody would have to. I just like it was heartbreaking to me, and I reached my hand out, gloves on and all, and just put my hand on his arm. And at that moment, I got like a a, a burst of what he did. So it's like that energy was so strong, and still with him. And yes, I can feel energy, but at that point, I had no idea I could do that. So it was a shock. I actually saw what he did. And, but when I did that and I saw what happened, I guess I was teary eyed because one of the sheriffs came up, put his arm around me and was like, he needs to like, detach from the tape and turn you lose your mind. So I just empathized so heavily with this man because he was, he had cancer, I had cancer. Finding how bad the pain was. And it does get hard. But he is always with me to remind me never to do that. Never go that route. 
because I will never forget him. Like, I will never forget that case. I feel I'm with me, just reminding me and helping me and guiding. And I do believe it's like a soul family, like a, a bond with this soul. Yes. I just I, met him after death instead of before. You know? You've said I, that you live your dreams for him as well as for yourself. Yeah. When I got better from cancer and I was like a beaming light, which is happiness because I realized like I could have been stuck in my body. So high school is great. And then, you know, in my 20s, I worked with the dead. And then I went to nursing school and I became a nurse. But yeah, the, the autopsy assistant thing was pretty cool. It was like a weird job in the sense of like scientifically and human body wise, because uh, the human body fascinates me, especially because my body just healed itself and I woke up. So, you know, I knew that was in there, but it took years to actually come out to where I could see where maybe I, if I would have known certain things, how to shield myself more with working with all these traumatic cases, like I'm picking up energy, but I didn't know. So eventually it just bleeds down on you because you're not processing it. That can backfire. You know, in the medical field, we're expected to just compartmentalize everything we see and deal with it later. Eventually those compartments explode because you aren't dealing with anything and that's only a burnout <laughs> yes so, i've seen a lot of those as a hospital chaplain i saw many yeah. nurses and some doctors go through burnout yeah. you always wanted to be a pediatric nurse now something happened in 2014 you had a, a loved one who died and you i guess you were in despair about that but along with that you had expressed a desire at some time to have a child Oh, I've always wanted a child. Yeah. You know, I was always that little girl that had the baby doll. That's I wanted to be a mother more than anything. And then to hear at 13, before I even become a woman, I wasn't even a woman yet, that I may not ever be able to have kids. It was just like, I never believed it. So I was like, yeah, whatever. I mean, listen, when I woke up for something, they were like, she's not going to make it. And I woke up and was like, hey, I'm fine. I Take their words. You the brain and soul. God knows. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's the whole thing. And that was one good thing with, with pediatrics. They really do um, support the family a lot. I think in adult medicine, that is kind of missing um, the family support because they really, they really do. Um, I don't know, maybe it is missing. Yeah. Well, your friend who died and then came back, or perhaps it was an angel. Tell us that story. In 2014, I had a loved one that passed away, and it was, it rocked everybody in the family. And I fell into a state of despair because I actually had not even remembered my near-death experience yet. And I started to fall. Like, I lost my faith, and I was lost. Well, I'd been running on faith that were saying it's, you know, the beginning. So I started to lose my faith. I couldn't understand why God would take this person and not me. I just didn't understand. I really was mad at God. I was mad. I was. I would fly outside and I would say, what do you want from me? Like, I just want a baby. Everybody around me is having babies. And now this happens with the family. It was like such a heartbreaking situation alone. My life catapulted into like an entirely different life and then i did fall into a state of despair and i didn't want to win i was just done and i was in so much pain the pain now from the loss it just it was like a ripple effect it hurt everywhere every ounce of existence i had hurt but you know i just felt like something was there that pulled my shirt right before his slammed face burst into the ground, like a guardian angel. Then I started to get out of his mind. I just, all of a sudden, it was like baby fever. Like, I wanted a baby now. I'm serious. And I did. I had been trying, been trying for years, but, you know, with having chemotherapy, it was most likely that I might not be able to have a baby, but it was never said that I can't. It just depended. And I always had a lot of faith. I always felt this kid. I'm like, 
I don't care what anybody says. I know where I'm feeling. And then the loved one that passed away, it was around Christmas of 2015, I think, because I remember Christmas tree was up. And I'm at a spiritually transformative event. I'm not really sure what happened, but I ended up like in my kitchen with the pass on loved one. But she is light, but looked like her. And she gave me a hug and thanked me. And I was just in my head, like, I think I'm on the couch. How am I here? Like, I was just confused of what was happening. And she hugged me. And when she hugged me, it was just such a healing feeling. And I woke up. And the peace just flowed through me. Like, everything just was at peace. And I was crying because I knew that was an angel. Like, that was God showing me that person one last time so I don't have to remember because it's very hard to remember somebody's the last thing you remember they're in a caution that's sometimes start for people to go to funerals because of that you know but this was a, a last memory that made everything so beautiful after that I was so filled with joy and happiness and so much excitement about things. And then I did. I ended up working out, getting my body straight, eating right, doing all the things I needed to do for my body to actually get pregnant. Because I think that was the issue. It was just so toxic from everything. And I basically detoxed from everything and I got pregnant. But what I did was I started to just meditate under like the moon more, connect with the earth more. And when I started to do the thing, then I was guided to take certain herbs. So I did that. Uh, there was so much guidance coming on me, even to the point of like just visualizing the baby developing well. And like just, it's really just like mind and over matter stuff. And it just will help you to connect even with the baby. But I ended up pregnant after doing all of these things. But my son was with me the entire time. I saw a vision of him and I was like, I knew it was a 20 week fetus all on a screen. I was getting a scan and I was not pregnant, but I looked up and there was a 20 week fetus. <laughs> and I was like, I look over in the line. I am not 20 weeks pregnant. So I looked at her, the tech and she don't see anything. And I was like, oh man, this kid's coming soon. And like, I would tell my husband find things and then boom, two months. After I had, uh, I was hugged by an angel, I ended up conceiving this baby that I never thought I could have. And he is better than words could ever describe. Well, now he's six and he knows he's on a mission. The kids these days are amazing. They're so, so open spirit. I had a question. Your memory and your mood and everything was so elevated by this angelic hug in the form of your deceased friend. Have you ever wondered whether or not your son's soul was perhaps a reincarnation of your friend? I don't necessarily believe that. I believe that can happen. But for my situation, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. But my friends did protect his soul while he was, you know, before he embodied, ah. before he was born. So he was with her. It was almost like just a babysitter, almost not to jump ahead, but I've had a miscarriage. And when I see that baby in meditation, I miscarried at like nine weeks. She's mm. five. And that's because she grew up as, as a spirit and you know, spiritually and so did I. She taught me a huge lesson. So spiritually, yeah, I mean, that could totally, that's like a whole nother. <laughs> So she's growing up on the other side. Yes. I was like a little confused. Like, wait a minute. What? But it was. She grew spiritually because she helped me wear a huge lesson. And then she's waiting with my grandmothers or with her until I get there. So I feel her with me. But, um, and I know people say, how would you know at nine weeks? I didn't. So your son is named Declan after a Scottish... <laughs> Saint? Irish? Yeah. Irish. Yeah. yeah. And when he was three, you told me, you were standing and he was behind you and he said that your deceased grandmother appeared to him with a message. Yeah. 
when he was three. Yeah, I was folding laundry, and I hadn't talked to him a whole lot about Grandma Drummond. Grandma Drummond, she died in in 2014, so this was just when he like three years ago. So she was already passed, and he had never met her in person. So he comes up behind me while I'm doing laundry one day, and he's like, um, Mommy, Grandma Rowan's behind you. And I'm like, I didn't turn around. I just was like, oh, because I said, where is she? And he said, she, that's what happened. He said, Grandma Drummond's here. And I said, where is she? And he goes, I'm behind you. And I was like, does she have anything to say? And he's like, she said, I love you. And I was like, I love you too, Grand. And like kids, toddlers are very open spiritually so when they can start talking it gets really interesting to see what they're gonna see <laughs> yes. you know when they can actually share what they're seeing because he probably didn't see her since birth you know but now he now he can say that's grandma drumming it was crazy but i was like you know but his generation they're so gifted these kids come in now up until the age of three or four sometimes older Children have still got roots on the other side. They've got a foot in both yeah. places, and they see things and remember things from past lives. And speaking yeah. of past lives, you had a memory of being burned at the stake in the 1600s for being a pregnant priestess. So describe... Well, not for being a pregnant priestess. Yeah. I was in the 1600s. I was a priestess, mm -hmm. and I was married to a priest. Yes. Well, that's how it was done back then. That was not a bad thing. But I was pregnant. But I wasn't shown. Oh, so, they didn't. I, they didn't burn you for being pregnant. Yeah. Do you know? Remember any of the other details? They didn't I? They wanted to burn female priestesses. They wanted to rid. It was just patriarchy taking all the women out, and that's what happened in the witch trials. It was all just hearsay and they torture people. You know, like oh, well, we're gonna drown you, and if you float, then you're not a witch. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there I remember past lives that came up like that, uh, when I did the the Reeking Master, you know, teacher initiation, because you really do. There's a lot you have to clear in order to make way for the energy to come through. Um, and be as potent as possible. So the more work I do on myself, the better for my clients, you know, and my patients because I'm more of a channel. So I know I was a priest in a past life and I definitely got burned at the stake. I, in another past life, I was hung for being a witch, supposedly a witch. But this is like, even when I, you know, even, even speaking about near death experiences, some people think it's witchcraft. So, you know, um, I think I'm being called the witch for a lifetime, and I'm okay with that because you can call me what you want to call me, just don't call me late for dinner. So. <laughs> now, you in this lifetime, and I guess made a connection through the internet and ultimately joined with a group called the Magdalene Rose Priestesses. Tell yeah. us about that and what their goals are. Um, the Magdalene Rose Temple, it is a temple based in Glastonbury. And Basically, it's, you know, in the U.S., priestesses are not a thing, but this is based out of the U.K. So I was definitely guided by my ancestors because I have Irish and Scottish ancestors. So I know I was guided by my grandfather to this temple because he guided me a lot. I found it online. Who finds a random priestess temple online? This was <laughs> after, right, like... In the UK, no less. On Facebook. But this is, I asked for my God, it's free. Like, use my phone, guide me. I don't care. Like, are we going to do it? Whatever works for, you know, because then when you get that sign and you sing your app, they're like, yeah. So I went, and it was such a journey to finding out that I actually had ancestors that were priestesses and druidesses. So when I did my priestess initiation, I actually, it brings you, it's like a guided meditation and there's, uh, you kind of go down, uh, it, it down like a winding staircase, basically in like a castle, imagine the stones and you come down and there's a fire pit in the middle and around this fire pit were all of these women wearing white 
holding hands, walking around the fire. And when I walked up to them, they opened the circle, brought me into my hand. And I realized they were all my ancestors who were also priests. And that's why we're bringing it back because we need the standard in with the masculine. If we do not have enough balance right now spiritually because it's too much mass, too much masculine. Like, so I do feel called to do this. Um, a priestess, the goal is to spread love and light. I can't say I'm like a Catholic priest. I mean, I can, I don't have to, um, it's celibacy is not a thing. I mean, even, even with, uh, the Catholic church, they're the only religion where you can't, you're not married as a priest. Every other religion, rabbis are married. Every other religion, it's like, they, it's the only religion that's pretty tight with those rules. So it's not like I can marry or anything like that, but it's, it really is. Honestly, I feel like I'm married to God and that sounds so important. That's really how I feel like. When I did this, I was hurting so bad from having a miscarriage. I mean, shatter. Like, I'd never even heard myself cry the way I was crying when I lost that baby. When my grandmother was there the whole time, ground dry, you can, you know, she was there with me the entire time I was going through the, through the grief of that. And then I was guided to the temple because I was just initiated already. And then you just go into, I mean, basically you already, these priestesses and priests, you're chosen at birth. You eventually, you walk that path, you're chosen to walk that path. And honestly, it worked so well. It's been such a blessing in my life. It makes even Reiki better, like it, which I can channel the Reiki even better for my patients. And, you know, I have a lot of people I do Reiki on that love it. And it's very, very helpful. So, yeah, I'm, a, I, I'm devoted to Mary Magdalene. Uh, basically, Jesus lives in my heart, or Yeshua, because his actual name is Yeshua, not Jesus. But Yeshua is in my heart. Mary Magdalene is at my root, walking with me on this earth, guiding me. And Mother Mary is at my crown, guiding me. So it's a full channel. So that's why it's like Magdalene Rose. It's a rose priestess. And it's really not understood in the U.S. too much. Because anytime I say priestess, I get like, it's not anything dark. <laughs> like, <laughs> it can. And I have had people confuse that. Like, it's I'm not a satanic priestess. It's like, basically what I'm doing, it's like Christian mysticism. So with Christianity like a different it's not christianity but it's going about it in a different way that's all because I, I have been in a lot of questions when i bring that up but i i tell people because listen you can open up to me if you are if you're on the end of your rope right now you cannot open up to me like i am a because i am a priestess so like i'm there for people and if you know that you know actually i just say i'm a nurse and then they open up but it is like nursing and God, you know what I mean? Like a lot of nurses are very spiritual. Because... Yeah. And, and more than that, you're, a, you're a Reiki nurse and the yeah. Reiki is energy healing. Now you've, you've mentioned that you've done Reiki from a distance. How does that work? Um, I've done a lot of distance Reiki in 2020 because, you know, we couldn't be around people, but everybody was having anxiety from being pooped in the house and stuff. So when I did distance Reiki, I was doing a lot between 2020 and 2021, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. But it was incredible because I would do it via, you know, either like probably FaceTime or Zoom, just so I could see my client and we can make that connection. And then I envision them on my Reiki table. And the crazy part is they can feel me when I have my hands on their hands. They are seeing what I'm trying to do, seeing what I'm saying, seeing what I'm doing. And it's like right I'm on point to the point where like one time I had a client where his pants are down and I was like, oh, I was thinking in my head because at this point, my, the client was fully in a meditative state. And if I would have touched his hands, I would have pulled him right out of it. So I was like, whatever, whatever. And then saying, no, <laughs> he went like this. And I was like, so that was in-person Reiki. That was in-person. 
But I get that a lot with distance Reiki. I have clients all over the world, you know, it's international because of the distance Reiki. And it actually works. Like it, it works. I actually did my Reiki master teacher initiation via distance because I wanted to see what it felt like. Yeshua was in my room with Mary Magdalene. That was my, my, like, um, attunement. What I saw, it was Yeshua over my face healing my heart and Mary Magdalene healing my womb and Mother Mary just holding space. So it was incredible. It took the priestesshood and Reiki and just spun it all together. And it worked so amazing. And I feel so much better. And that's the point. I feel better. You know, I'm still in pain. I still have, you know, weakness sometimes. I'm, you know, my body's been banged up. It's been 27 years, but I'm still cancer free. And I really do. I attribute a lot of that to um, my attitude to like, it's not that that will make me cancer free. It's not. I mean, I got you know, if I, that, I've gotten 27 extra years. I mean, that's incredible. I lend my fullest because I actually thought I only had 20 years because I was like 13 or 14 and they said to me, hey, you could live another 20 years. But with the type of cancer I had at that time, that was a long time to live. So when I did live, I was like, all right, so what do I got now? Like 17 years left? Because like they told me, I thought I had 20 years for a very long time. So after that, and then I got pregnant, that was a death. A death and rebirth into a mother. I always thought I was going to die in like at that 20 year mark. And it really was actually just, I became a mother. So it was a death and rebirth. But if I didn't change my ways, it probably would have been an actual death. Like it was, it was at that crossroad and it was, it was, um, I was just very depressed. You know, I was lost. A lot of people are lost right now. But if I could say one thing to people who are lost right now, like the light is there. Keep looking, you know, do not give up because it will be a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And you don't know what is beyond this pain. Because there's something amazing coming. And like that was my thing. In two months, I got my dream. And if I would have ended my life at that point, I would have crossed over and realized I'm so close to getting to like physically hold. Of course, it, you know, if he was not hurt, he would be me with me on the other side. But the thing is that um, on earth, I get to enjoy like everything, you know, you got a body, go see things, feel the dirt. Like I act like a kid, I work with kids. So I act like a kid, like with my son, you know, we go play Minecraft while we go walk in nature. It's just, it, it's been the most amazing thing to me. And I took a long time wondering why did it take so long, but she came at the perfect time, like, he brought the light back to the family. Um, everybody was just, everybody was so full of joy because we had a new life now. And um, it, he came and healed a lot of people. And I, and that was my intentions. I want to bring him here. So everybody he touches, everybody that he captures, they feel the loving healing light from him. Now, at the moment you delivered him, you had an out of body experience. Yeah. Tell us, tell us about that and how you met his soul. So at the moment of uh, delivery, I actually have I can even count it because I remember the nurse was like, "All right, get ready to push on the count of three, push!" And I heard one, and that was it. I was in complete darkness, mm. and. Then I came back and she was like, good job. So she said two or three and push, but I was out of body and didn't hear her. So I remember that distinctly because I was like, I'm, and I must, I was like more spiritually aware at that age. So I was like, Ooh, I didn't hear two, three. And I was like, I did go somewhere. Now I have something I can measure to see like three, three earth seconds 
could have been 25 years in the void and I came back. You know, like the time doesn't really cross over, but it's crazy to think that. But yes, I went, um, yeah, then I, I birthed him. And, you know, there is a saying that you go, a mother goes to the stars to gather the, the soul of her child and they both come back down to earth together and to be reborn the mother is being reborn it doesn't matter if it's your second third sixth trial every chin you're being reborn in another way this is a completely different soul you're bringing the earth you know um and that soul is going to teach you and you're going to teach them so um but Declan yeah he he just just the dream that's having him has got me through so much pain so now that I've had him I mean I it's like Every day is, and it is, it's more like, as he's getting older, um, you know, they tend to go through that phase of like, not believing in spiritual things, maybe because like fairies are from girls and like, we're Scottish and Irish, like fairies are actually not from girls. They come to me. I've had fairies actually come to me in, in, in a Reiki session. And it was kind of really funny. Like they were kind of. Like they told me I had to clean up my, my fairy garden because they wanted to go in it, but it was a mess. And I was like, all right. And I told the client, I'm like, do you believe in fairies? She's like, yeah, I have two fairy gardens. Once inside and one out, I was like, your fairies came to me and like, they're with you. Just so you know, like they actually like what you're doing and I need to like chop, chop and clean up. I was like, that was the funniest thing I ever had happened with one of the Reiki, you- like the distance of point, um, that's like that. Did you actually see them or did you just hear them? I, um, I see them in my mind's eye and hear them inside, you know, so it's not like they're out here They're I see it all, but whatever I'm seeing, what I'm doing, um, I'm just paying attention to what I'm seeing too. I basically just, I, per, I, uh, before I start a session, it's always, you know, I ask Archangel Michael to protect us while we're in a space. I ask, you know, Archangel Raphael to come out here to heal. Uh, so I protect the space. Like I open the space up to be a space of just, I just go completely. And I know when I'm, I'm really in there because we're oddly enough, I know when I have centered in because my ears pop. So I always know that. And then it's just like, I could feel the flow of energy because I get like hot. When I start getting warm, I know that's Reiki. Like that's the Reiki really flowing good. So, um, and that's all the distance. Like when I feel in person, um, like I have clients that I, I work with in person that live near me that I can drive to. Uh, it's a little bit different, but I still don't really put my hands on you. I will... I you maybe your head, you know what I mean? Like I do Reiki starting from the top and then like the hand, um, shoulders, back. It's just it it's not a massage, but I could even do Reiki without touching anybody. I can like I said, because it's energy healing, so energy goes wherever you intend it to go. So you really don't have to be in person with an energy healer for them to help. You heal because they're not, we're not, I'm not healing anybody. I'm just the best soul and the healing is up to the client and the energy is going to do a lot of work and I tell them what to expect. Um, but yeah, I've had so many great, um, people that I use a lot of the Reiki in the nursing field because that's basically where I use it with the babies and stuff like that. Um, we did a lot of uh, that. Uh, there was a team of, I guess I mentioned to you yesterday, a team of Reiki uh, volunteers at our hospital, and I always recommended people in pain to have a session with them. You said yesterday regenerative regener, regenerative medicine is wow. vibrational medicine, and, of course, Reiki is vibrational as well. To yeah. Talk a little about that and why why is it Western medicine doesn't even understand the beginnings of that? Set. Well, they're starting to now regenerative medicine. And I'm always looking into this stuff because 
ever since I went through chemotherapy treatments, it just destroyed my body. My thing was always like, there's got to be a better way. Like, there can't, this can't be the only thing, chemotherapy. So um, I've always thought that way. And then I worked in the lab and then I became a nurse, you know. So I've always worked in the medical field. Um, but, you know, um, I just lost what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> About Western medicine. Uh, oh, right. Regenerative medicine, yeah. No. Uh, regenerative medicine is pretty new, but they're still working. Um, it's not fully accepted, you know what I mean? At stem cell therapies and um, plasma rich protein therapies, but it's basically the body healing the body. You take it yeah. from the patient and you spin it down and you get it back to them in a different way and it heals the body. Um, that's so exciting, but that we are just on the tip of regenerative medicine. If I go to a regenerative medicine specialist and say, well, Reiki is part of regenerative medicine because it does regenerate, that's why it lasts out pretty good. I mean, if I was like on the East Coast, if I said on the West Coast, it might make sense. But <laughs> I'm, um, you know, it's not quite there. Nobody really even knows what Reiki is in the state that I live in, in, in New Jersey. So not everybody. It's getting a little bit more popular now, but yeah. It was, oh, it's uh, it's wonderful. I, I've, I've watched it work on others. I've had sessions myself. Yeah, I love uh, it. I just love it. Jennifer, if someone wanted to do a, a distance session with you, how would they get in touch with you? Tell us how, about your, do you have a website or a I do. Facebook I have, page? I have a website and a Facebook page. Uh, my Facebook page, I'm Jennifer Ann on Facebook, and I tried to change that to Jennifer Dean, but it's what will feel on me. So I'm just Jennifer Ann. Okay. And also I have Mystical Mama, M-A-M-A, so Mystical and then M-A-M-A. If you look up Mystical Mama, I share a lot of things about like the energy, what's happening right now energetically. So if you're feeling all of these things, just ground your energy, you might feel better type of things, just reminders to energetically what's happening. So that's Mystical Mama. And then my website is heavenandearthhealing.net. So heavenandearthhealing.net is the website with everything I offer. Um, like with different types of healings, wound healing and Reiki. So, yeah, you need to check that out for sure. Lovely. Jennifer Dean, thank you so much for sharing your spiritually transformative experiences with us today and how thank you're, you so and how you're also how your ND led to establishing your career in healing, which is, uh, uh, you know, back, uh, there's a long tradition of, uh, a division between the, the Western male masculine attack on healing and right. and the and the mystical feminine vibrational form of healing, and I think right. if the women got a chance, they would be much honored for their healing abilities. Right, and that's the thing in in the future within my five year plan or want to um, make something for women, you yeah. know, a group. For women, uh, you know, where we can come together and heal ourselves so we can be there to heal our men too, or women or whatever, just that healing ripple effect. When you heal yourself, you are healing everybody else because they're, you're able to bring that light through. So my five-year plan, definitely, um, I, I, I'm planning something so awesome and if it works out it's gonna be like heaven on earth for real so i'll i'll keep every update check out like mystical llama and uh i'll put anything up there that i am offering um and i would love for anybody if you feel drawn to me i'm here so i'm just here to help <laughs> lovely if listeners would like to hear this show again or any of our more than 490 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app and listen next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more 
NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.